Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have our 26th lecture and I will talk about geothermal energy. One of the main questions in this lecture, of course, is can geothermal energy play an important role in the energy supply of the world? If you look at this nice picture here, this is a picture I took about 20 years ago when I was on a trip to the US. You can have a stop by in Iceland and there you have this very nice lagoon where you can go swimming even if it's cold outside. So what is that? This is a geothermal power station here. It's close to the airport at Reykjavik and it produces 475 liters per second at high temperatures, about 90 degrees Celsius. Using that hot water and the steam a generator is running and produces electrical power of 76 megawatt. And in addition, the remaining hot water is used for district heating and of course, what is especially nice for the people around and the tourists is that this hot salty water which they get out of the ground is used for a big thermal pool where you can have a nice bath. This water is basically the wastewater from the geothermal power plant and it is very salty, has a lot of minerals and people use that also to heal some of their diseases. Nowadays there are quite a few geothermal power plants on the earth. A lot of them are in Iceland and also in New Zealand. Here you see a second example from Iceland, another power plant which has even more hot water and 120 megawatt electrical power. And then they don't use this hot water for bathing but there's a heat exchanger with fresh water so they heat up fresh water and there's a pipeline going to Reykjavik and in Reykjavik they use that hot water for heating. And what is especially nice in this power station is they have big tanks here to keep the hot water. So on a hill close to Reykjavik they have 4000 cubic meters of water storage at about 85 degrees Celsius and there they keep the hot water for the winter when there is a large need for heating water. So these are very good examples of geothermal power. You use it for electricity production and in addition you use it for district heating and you can store the hot water for the winter when there is more district heating needed. So this is basically all you want to have from a renewable energy system. And of course power production runs day and night and over the whole year because geothermal energy is there all the time. So in the next minutes I would like to explain you a little bit deeper where the geothermal energy comes from. So this is the last of the series of the most important renewable energy sources. We had biomass, solar, wind and hydro and today we talk about geothermal. There are of course a few other things which you can use for renewable energy production. For example there are power plants which use the osmotic forces at the mouth of a river when it enters the salty sea to produce energy and there are quite a few more smaller examples which allow you to produce renewable energies but this one here is the last one of the most important sources. So for fun now I would like to go to the flat earth theory because there are more and more people believing in those kind of fairy tales and uh, here you see a picture how the world looks like in this flat earth theory and it's clear where does the geothermal energy come from. Well it's easy to explain. There must be a fire below this flat earth and this is probably fired with coal because there's coal under the earth and this way of course you can explain geothermal energy. I just take this funny example only to tell you what is the difference of a real theory, of a scientific theory and of a fake theory which was invented by somebody for whatever reasons. Well the main difference is that in the real science there are a lot of connections and by understanding the basic laws you can explain more and more of all the phenomenons which you see in the world. Whereas in these fake theories normally 
whenever there is a new phenomenon or a new measurement, you have to expand your theory by something new, which is just invented ad hoc. So there's no way to deduce from basic principle how all the details in our world are working. So let's go back to the real science. And there, of course, we know that the Earth is not flat, but it's a bowl. And this round bowl has an interior and this interior is hot. And geothermal energy is nothing else than the heat coming out from the center of the Earth. Just for comparison, now we can think about how big is the crust of the Earth, because we know inside of the Earth it's liquid. The crust is going around. That makes our land. And of course, also below the oceans, there is a solid land. And this crust is very thin at the Earth. And I took here a comparison with something you all know. This is an egg here. And this egg also has a solid crust and inside it's liquid. And if you compare the size of the crust of the egg, the shell of the egg, then you find out that the egg shell is about a factor of three more thick compared to the size of the egg than the crust of the earth is. So the crust of the earth is a very thin layer of solid material, which keeps the hot liquid inside uh, separated from the cold atmosphere and the vacuum of the universe. So the crust is very sensitive and we all know if there is a problem with the crust of the earth, you have a volcano and in the volcano, of course, you see immediately there's a liquid lava coming out at very high temperatures. So that is why we know that below our ground, there is a big liquid area of very hot stuff. And now, of course, we have to understand where this heat comes from. So people have calculated and measured how much heat is coming out. The result is that it's about 44 terawatt heat flow coming through the crust. We know that the deeper you go into the ground, the hotter it becomes. And so you have a temperature gradient. And from this temperature gradient, you can calculate the heat flow. Anybody who has been in a deep mine knows as soon as you go into a cave, it's becoming cold because the earth around is typically 15 degrees Celsius. But if you go deeper and deeper, one or two or 3000 meters deep in deep coal mines or gold mines, for example, the deeper you go, the hotter it is. And that is, of course, because Below there is the lava, which is very hot, and the hot lava emits heat, which is then flowing through the crust of the Earth and coming out there. This is a cross-section of the Earth here. <coughs> we know nowadays that the crust, as I said, is very thin. It's not everywhere the same. There are regions where it's big, for example, in areas where there are high mountains, and there are other areas where it's thinner, for example, in the oceans. Below you have the liquid lava, the upper and the lower mantle. And below that there is a core which has different chemical constituents. Whereas above we have some kind of mixtures of stones and minerals. The core of the earth mainly consists of iron and nickel. And there we distinguish between a more or less liquid outer core, which has about 3000 degrees Celsius, and an inner core, which is so much compressed that even at the 6000 degrees Celsius, it is a solid body. Nickel and iron are also the reasons why there's a magnetic field around the Earth. But we don't want to go into those details. Instead, we have to ask the questions, where does the heat come from? One of the options, of course, would be that when the earth was built at that time, it was very hot and all liquid. And since then it's cooling down. That would be a possibility in principle. The earth has an age of about four and a half billion years. And then you can calculate if there's a hot earth, which cools down, how much heat will it produce? Or the other question would be how much temperature there would be in so that the heat 
after four and a half billion years is still 44 terawatt. So if you do a back of the envelope calculation, you just calculate the heat capacity of the Earth and track the yearly energy flow. Uh, there are reasonable numbers coming out, but in reality it's much more sophisticated because the temperature of the Earth is changing, the constitution of the Earth is changing, and the heat flow of course depends on the constitution. So what scientists found out is that the original heat from the Earth is not responsible for the fact that it's still so hot because it would have cooled down in the meantime. So the geothermal energy does not come from the generation of the Earth. What other options are there? Well, first of all, there are physical and chemical reactions which take place as a mixture of chemical elements. Uh, the heavy iron falls down into the center. So not so heavy silicon or oxygen stay outside. And so there's gravitational effects and chemical effects and so on. So that could also be the reason, but also here the experts say that is not the reason for this 44 terawatt which are coming out. Then we have to think about the next possible option. And if you don't know what the reason is, it's always the fault of the moon, of course. So we think about could be the moon the reason for the geothermal energy. Well, if you think about it, there, here's a nice picture of the Earth and the moon taken from the Mars. So you know, of course, that the moon is circulating around the Earth and that the Earth is rotating by itself around its own axis. And of course, if the Earth is rotating around its axis, there's an influence of the moon on the Earth. So the moon is the reason why we have high and low tides in the oceans. And this is shown in the picture which you see here. The tides not only produce a motion of the water, but this motion of the water, of course, leads to a loss of energy. And actually, it's not only the water, it's also the crust, which is moving by the gravity of the moon. And due to friction on Earth, the motion of the water and the motion of the crust produces friction. And this friction means there is an energy loss and there's a heating up of the Earth. And this energy for the friction, of course, has to come from some source. And the source, of course, is the rotation of the Earth. So in other words, as the Earth is rotating, it has a certain rotational energy. And due to the moon, there's a deceleration due to the tides. And the deceleration of the Earth means there's energy becoming free. And the rotational energy of the Earth due to energy conservation then is converted into heat energy on the Earth. And people have measured the deceleration by tides. So they have measured the Earth rotation and people have found out that 300 million years ago, a day was only 20 hours, whereas today it's 24 hours. So the Earth becomes slower and slower over time. Question is, can we measure that today without looking into the past? Because it's always more difficult to find something out about the long past ago. Well, today we have very precise clocks and we can observe very precisely when there is the sun going up in the morning and when there is noon. So people measured the exact time of the Earth's rotation within a millisecond range. And this is plotted here. So the curve which is shown here, which is fluctuating, this gray line shows you how much longer an Earth day is compared to this 24 hours. This was measured the last 60 years. And we find out that in the average, the, the rotation of the Earth was such that a day was about two milliseconds longer than this 24 hours. And if you add up this two milliseconds and integrate it over 40 years, you get this red line here showing you that over this 40 years, you get something like 30 seconds integrated in total and this by this 30 seconds 
the high noon at 12 o'clock would be shifted and in order to have high noon always at 12 o'clock they invented to have this leap second so every two years about the year is about one second longer than usually compared to this exact 24 hours and this way you compensate for this drift of this time but now let's go back to the direct measurement the gray line which tells you the length of a day compared to this 24 hours and there we see there are lots of fluctuations and if you look at it more closely you see that it's going up and down once a year so there are seasonable changes of the earth rotation which have to do with the temperature and probably with the vegetation then there are certain peaks for example there's a peak in the year 1983 which people can explain due to a strong El Nino effect in the southern Pacific so even climate changes you can see in the earth rotation but if you now look at the long-term behavior you see the average of this gray line goes down so that means the length of the day becomes not longer but it becomes shorter yeah so in 1970 the day was about three milliseconds longer than 24 hours and today it's less than one millisecond longer than 24 hours so the earth rotation becomes slower this is in contradiction to the long-term behavior and has and this shows you again that there are quite a few complicated effects in the earth system and even things like strong winds which hit a big mountain area like the himalaya they push the earth rotation on a very short term scale so a lot of the climate effects also have an effect on the earth rotation this shows you a good example to see again how complicated the earth system is to understand it in all detail so but now let's go back to the long term effects in the long term the earth rotation becomes slower and slower and i just want to show you a little bit of physics now so we really have to do a little bit of physics but this will take only five minutes so those people who don't like physics they just relax and make yourself a coffee and then when the coffee is ready then we will be back again to geothermal energy so now let's talk about the rotational energy of the earth and try to calculate with some basic physics assumption how much energy production there can come out of the earth because of the slowdown of the rotation so the rotation of the earth is 24 hours one day which is 86,000 seconds the mass of the earth and the radius is known and now let's assume that on the long term the change of the day is about 0.017 milliseconds in every year so every year by 0.017 milliseconds the day is longer then you can use basic physics so to calculate the rotational energy we need the moment of inertia and for that we assume that the earth here as I show you is just a solid ball and this solid ball has a moment of inertia of two-fifths times the mass of the earth times the radius squared and if it, this is rotation around itself it has a so-called angular velocity omega which is 2 pi divided by the period of the rotation which is one day and from that you can calculate the rotational energy of the ball and this is one half times i times omega squared that is the rotational energy the earth has assuming this very simple model and if you now differentiate the rotational energy so you check how much energy change there is when the period of the day is changing so you have to differentiate the energy de over dt the period of the day and then you multiply it by this delta t of 0.017 milliseconds in one year and then you get the total energy release in one year and this you can then calculate to be three 
thousand gigawatt of energy which is released due to the effect that on the long scale the earth becomes slower and slower which means that the energy becomes less and this must be converted into heat and this heat must be emitted. This 3000 gigawatt of course are 3 terawatt and compared to the 44 terawatt of heat flow of course this calculated 3 terawatt are small. In other words, even though we have had a very simple calculation here, what we find out is that the tidal effect of the Earth cannot be the reason for this heat which is coming out of the Earth. So let's think about the next option and the next option is now found to be really the biggest effect. What one finds is that in the Earth there are radioactive elements. Yeah, you all know that uh, depending where you live, you have, if you have a house, then in your cellar there is radioactive radon coming out. And this radon comes from uranium, which is below the ground and which decays. So from that we know that there is a lot of uranium in the ground, also thorium and radioactive kalium. And these radioactive elements decay over thousands and millions of years and this decays produce heat and the total nuclear power which comes out of the ground due to these radioactive elements in the earth they are estimated to be about 20 to 30 terawatt. So this is probably the biggest part of the geothermal energy. You know I'm a particle physics and nowadays we are able to measure directly these radioactive decays because these radioactive decays produce neutrinos. These neutrinos go through the earth without any problem and they can be measured in detectors on the ground. And from these measurements we know that this nuclear power has to have this order of magnitude. However, the measurements are not very precise so there can always be a change in the actual numbers. So the total geothermal power, which is about 44 terawatt, comes to a big extent from the nuclear reactions and the nuclear decays in the earth, in the center of the earth. So how much geothermal energy is that then now? Well, this 44 terawatt have to be compared with the human energy use, which is today about 18 terawatt. That means that if we would be using the whole geothermal power of the whole globe, we would have more energy than we need. But of course, the geothermal power is emitted everywhere on the globe. It's emitted below the ocean, it's emitted at the poles. So uh, for the large majority of the geothermal power, we don't have any excess. For this part where we have excess, we can only use it in a quite inefficient way because of all the efficiencies in the conversion of the heat of the ground to electricity. So if we have a small area, we can calculate how much energy comes out of this area. So we divide the 44 terawatt by the area of the globe. The area of a bowl is 4 pi times r squared. And if you do the calculation, you find out that the energy density from geothermal power on the average is about 0.1 watts per square meter. This we can compare to the power density of solar radiation as we have done it in lecture 4. And there we find out that we have about 1400 watt per square meter initial solar radiation on our Earth. So this is four orders of magnitude more compared to geothermal energy. In other words, solar power is so much more compared to geothermal energy that normally geothermal energy is not the first choice to use. Of course, there are different areas on the globe where the things are very different. Typically, you have a vertical temperature gradient of about 30 degrees per kilometer. So if you want to have 90 degrees 
you have to go down by 3000 meters. But if you're in an area where there's a lot of volcanism, like in Iceland or in New Zealand or in many other areas of the world, then you need a borehole of only maybe one or two kilometers to get hot steam out. And this way, of course, there are areas where it is very efficient to use geothermal energy. However, I have to tell you that in those areas where, they, where you use the geothermal energy, because it's very hot in this area underground, this is not completely renewable in the following sense, that if you take out the energy from this thousand meter underground, it will take some while and then the water which comes out will not be hot anymore because the area cools down over time and due to the insulation of the crust of the earth which consists of stones and has only a very limited possibility to transport heat from below the crust to above uh, then this area cools down so that after maybe 30 years uh, your power station will not work anymore in this area. So in this sense it's not completely renewable what you are doing. So you would have to wait a very very long time until this becomes hot again and you can use it as a power station. Of course instead you go to a neighboring area and then you see heat from the neighboring area. Here on this map you see uh, the United States and what is shown is the potential of geothermal energy. There you see nicely that there are areas where there is a lot of heat un shortly underground and other areas where even if you do deep boreholes there is not much temperature increase so there is not much potential to use geothermal energy for power production for example. So how do these power stations work? So this is shown in the diagram here. This shows your cut through the earth and you see on top there is a power station. Then you have boreholes which can go uh, up to 6000 meters because you have to go into an area where there is a very high temperature. And now the biggest difficulty is how to get the heat from these stones out of the ground upstairs to the power station. And the way it's done is shown on the right diagram here. What you do is you pump down water. This water is pressed with high pressure into the ground. It's a little bit like the way you do it if you do fracking. So high pressure can crack the stones and the liquid goes into the stones and then you need a second pipe and with the second pipe you take out the water so that the high pressurized water goes through the stones, is heated up and then as hot water or as steam it goes up. And then you have to separate the steam and the water. The steam runs the turbine and then it goes to a heat exchanger and there the remaining heat can be used for district heating and the salty water, if you don't want to use it, like in the Blue Lagoon for bathing, then should be pressed down again because this wastewater contains a lot of salt and also radioactive materials depending where you are. So you press it down again and you are circulating the salty water and this way you get the heat out of the ground and this will work for some decades and if you then have cooled down the area you have to move your pumping to the next site or you have to extract so little uh, that it is recovered all the time. So this is the way how geothermal power stations work and as I said they are only useful in certain areas. You don't have to dig too deep to get the energy out but the Geothermal power stations which use the hot steam from very high temperatures underground is not the only way to use geothermal energy and to my mind there is a much more important way to use the heat of the ground in another way and this is more related to energy storage 
than to energy production. So there we come to a completely different method. You use heat exchangers which are installed underground and with these heat exchangers you can store heat during the day and use it at the night or you can also store heat during the summer and use it in the winter and for that you need heat exchanger which then transport the energy of the ground to a different temperature level which can then be used for heating your houses and this is something which is completely renewable because it basically makes use of solar energy and the solar energy is stored in the ground and so it's not really geothermal energy but you use the ground as a heat storage so this is completely renewable and it makes use of the fact that the solar radiation is a factor of about 10,000 stronger than the original geothermal power which comes from below and this is a method which I would like to explain you in a bit more detail and for that we have to understand how heat pumps are working so we have to understand a bit more about the basic physics of thermal energy which is not so trivial as you might think. This is something we do in the next lecture. Thank you for listening. I hope I gave you a good impression on what you can do with geothermal energy and I'm looking forward to explain you more about thermal energy in the next lecture. Goodbye.